Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. And now to your hosts, Ken Jakes and Julie Johnson. Hi, this is Ken Jakes. I'm the host of Democracy That Delivers, our weekly podcast here at Psych. And I'm joined in studio uh, by my friend, Anna Kopanik. She's the director of the global department here at Psych. Hi, Anna. Hello, good to be here. How are you doing? And Great. we were just talking earlier that uh, we've done this once before, but we've done about 115 of these things. And I can't re exactly remember when we did it. But you've done a few of these overseas where we've taped and then we've we've added on once we got the tape back to Washington. That's so correct. I have been the overseas correspondent, but it's good to be the back in the studio. That <laughs> that's a good title, actually, overseas correspondent. And I'm joined also by our guest from uh, he's now in from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Not from there, but you're living there now. Yep. You were living here for 30 years, though. Your name is Jerry Zach, and you're the incoming CEO of CCEP. Uh, which is? Uh, it's actually the Society for Corporate Compliance and Ethics. Oh, yes. terrific. And tell me what you do there. Well, I'm the uh, incoming CEO there. And, uh, well, for starters, thanks for having me. Yeah, but, uh, we're looking forward to it. Yeah, it's it's a kind of an unusual title, and, and it stems from the fact that uh, Roy Snell, our uh, co-founder of the organization and longtime CEO, uh, announced his retirement last year. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Part of the transition plan that the organization came up with was sort of a one-year overlap period here. So I uh, began with the society on November the 1st, and uh, that period where I'm the incoming CEO and Roy is the CEO uh, will last up until this uh, upcoming November the 1st. What exactly does your organization focus on? Well, we focus on compliance programs and compliance and ethics programs uh, globally. Uh, the organization actually started out uh, focusing solely on the healthcare sector. Mm -hmm. uh, thus, we've got this sort of a long name of Society for Corporate Compliance and Ethics and the Healthcare Compliance Association. Uh, so it started out uh, solely in the healthcare sector, uh, but uh, a number of years ago now, the, the organization uh, expanded its focus uh, to, to focus more broadly on non-industry specific uh, global compliance and ethics programs. And in, in when you talk about programs, are you talking about training programs, uh, well, a both here in the United States and abroad? Or? Well, w one of the things that we offer is, is a lot of training, but our, our membership is comprised of compliance professionals and compliance professionals who uh, operate compliance programs uh, f you know, within their organization. So the whole focus of a compliance uh -huh. program, a little bit different than, say, what a general counsel's role is, a compliance program is focused on uh, sort of identifying compliance requirements, um, uh, making sure that uh, procedures are in place to comply uh, with legal and regulatory requirements, to perform ongoing monitoring, um, and then uh, if problems are found, sort of remediate the compliance-related problems. So it's kind of a holistic view of, of compliance. And your membership is not only here in the United States, but also abroad as well? Exactly. We've got, we've got 19,000 total members right now, and the global portion of that is now up to a couple thousand and, uh, and growing so rapidly. So that we equate to close to... 19,000 companies that they represent? Or? Yes, it's in some cases there are multiple members from the right. same company, but but no. But generally you're speaking, it's, it's pretty close. Exactly. So we're talking about a lot of companies. A lot of companies. And I'm assuming both large and small companies as yes, well. Yes, yes. Uh, quite an interesting mix, uh, both from a, a size perspective as well as, I mean, if, just to put this in, give, give us some perspective, because we just recently researched this, we've got members in 98 countries mm. and certified members in 85 countries. So, uh, the, the the global growth has been pretty impressive. Now, do you have a certification process of your own that that you go through that you have to, that you have to have before they can become members? Uh, they don't have to be certified to become a member. So we've we've got non-certified members, mm -hmm. but yes, we do offer a certification program. Mm -hmm. it, it's you know the globally recognized uh, program, the the the, the CCEP uh, and the CCEP. I, which is the international version of the Certified Compliance and Ethics Professional so Program. That. I, I noticed on your bio, too, that you've worked in nearly 20 countries, I think 17 to be precise, that, that, that I read. What's the number one problem that you've seen when you've done training programs in other countries? Well, it's, it's interesting. It, it's uh, because there are a variety of programs, and it does tend to change a little bit as you go to from one region of the world to another. Uh, but I, I would say that, you know, one of the recurring problems is 
uh, with the, the, the compliance program not getting a sufficient seat at the table, um, you know, as, as a senior enough position within the organization. It's, it's uh, the problem that we see is in, in some parts of the world more than others, you know, it's sort of tamped down or non-existent. And, and, and what, what's the reason behind that, do you think, what, that, that they don't, that they're not seen or they're not given the responsibility that, that they probably should within an organization. Yeah, I think it's a it's it's a, an, in part it's a natural maturation process of seeing what the benefits are to preventing finding and fixing problems as opposed to waiting for something big to blow up. Because when you th yeah. to kind of put it in in its most simplest terms, that's the real goal of a compliance professional is to prevent, find, and then remediate problems. So it's like preventive medicine in yeah. a way. Yeah, absolutely, and and uh, you know I don't think this is unique to this profession. Uh, and we've seen it in other professions as well. That until management sees the real value in taking a more proactive stance, um, they don't give it adequate uh, respect uh, and devote resources to it. And then, unfortunately, many of the companies that do. Uh, are the ones that have found out the hard way. You know, they've had a huge scandal, and if they right. only had a compliance the, the program, the Siemens of the world, and exactly, yeah, and yeah. that's what happens, yeah. And y so, so it's, it's it's more of a reactive mode rather than a proactive mode. And then what you try to do is is, is get companies and organizations to, to to take a more proactive approach to this to prevent things from happening in the future. Exactly, I mean, it's like a more proactive approach, and and some of what goes into a compliance program. Uh, is based upon some of the guidelines that uh, government agencies have put together. For instance, a lot of it started here in the United States with the, the federal sentencing guidelines, um, which are the guidelines that federal judges use in assigning penalties to corporations who are found to have violated a law. And, you know, there's an expectation that there be a compliance program uh, with, with all the elements of a compliance program in place. And if, for instance, if a company has a violation, it's pick a law, whether it's the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act or anything else, mm -hmm. um, the amount of their fine, their penalty, is going to vary widely based upon a lot of factors, one important factor of which is, did they have a compliance program in place? Um, compliance programs is certainly not a guarantee for no violations, but when the courts see that a company has has attempted to take a proactive approach, but something slipped through the cracks, or they did have the truly rogue employee who figured out a way around these controls, the organization is still going to get penalized, but it's going to be a lower penalty. Whereas when they see a company has not paid attention to it, and they've kind of buried their head in the sand and not implemented any kind of a proactive compliance program, the penalties go up. And, and that's many times how, how companies learn the hard way. But we're also now seeing other parts of the world adopt that same sort of approach. Mm. So the foreign, you mentioned the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. When did that come into effect? How many years ago was that it? That was back in the 1970s. 1970s. So that's, that's so it's been, been around a yeah. long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what type of evolution have you seen in terms of the way companies react to that uh, s since then? I mean, obviously it was due in the 1970s, and, 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 I, and I think you've seen an evolution where um, companies – thought they could get around, uh, not, not the act itself, but, but it's in their best interest maybe to bribe officials in other countries and, and things like that because it's, it's good business sense. I think th we've seen an evolution in that in, in the last several years where now companies are saying, look, this is really not good for our, our, our business model. We mentioned Siemens a while ago uh, where, where they got in trouble. What type of evolution have you seen in, in the thought process of companies since the 1970s? Well, and, and I think you're absolutely right about that. Com more and more companies are taking this seriously now. And, and there's a, a several factors associated with it. I'm not sure if there's any one that has driven it, but there are things like the increased rate with which the government is not only penalizing the company, but finding the individuals responsible for it and penalizing them uh, as individuals. Are there some countries that are more proactive in prosecuting individuals than the, yes, yeah. yes, and obviously the the U.S. lead Leads has led the, the yeah, way right. in that, but we do see it has been a significant increase uh, abroad as well. I mean, the United Kingdom and, and sure, but, but yeah. a number of other countries. Yeah. You know, for instance, uh, over the last several years, Brazil has been in the uh, spotlight a lot uh, yeah. for for taking legitimate, real efforts to enforce uh, yeah. corruption, anti-corruption yeah. laws. Well, you the public relations hit that a company takes, too, well. As that's well. Uh, you've read my mind because that's yeah. exactly the other point that I was going to make. I think increasingly we're seeing shareholders mm -hmm. say, hey, you know, w we want to make a uh, 
you know, make money off of this. We want our dividends. We want our stock to appreciate in value, but we want to do it the right way. Mm. And, and I think we're seeing because there's uh, long-term effects yeah. to this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and again, you know, I don't want to you know beat a dead horse with Siemens, but there's other companies like that. And by the way, companies like Siemens now kind of lead the way. They do in the compliance efforts and the anti-corruption efforts. Oh, so. Some of the best compliance programs in the <laughs> world are, are found in some of those companies yep. who, who learned the hard way. Who, who, uh, who had their hand in the cookie jar, yeah, so to yeah. speak. Look out for the next scandal. <laughs> for the ex exactly. Mm -hmm. And I want you to jump in here, and, and I'm sure you have some questions um, for Yes, Jerry. So I know that you are an accountant by training. Can you um, tell us a little bit more about your journey from that field into the compliance field? Because I feel like you kind of read my extent, mind and I was going to ask uh, you the same thing. It mirrors the evolution of the field uh, itself that uh, so compliance is a fairly new profession and people with different uh, prior backgrounds come to it. So tell us tell us your story. Yes, yes, it's a, it's a an interesting uh, point because and, and you're absolutely right. So many people that are currently in compliance didn't start out in compliance. Uh, they started out in other fields and they uh, either intentionally or just by default ended up in compliance. And uh, But what we now see are more and more you know, young professionals, uh, some of which have legal backgrounds and some of which some of whom don't. But uh, you know, as an alternative to for, for starters, for the, the people who are getting, say, a legal training, going to law school. Uh, do you have legal background? No, I you don't. don't. Okay. Uh, but more and more people are viewing that as an alternative to instead of just starting out with a law firm, maybe I'll start out in compliance. In my particular case, my my com you know evolution really uh, was was a very natural one of starting out in accounting and public accounting and doing audit work. The uh, nature of the audit work I did very quickly uh, evolved from purely financial auditing to compliance-related auditing. I was auditing a lot of organizations that had compliance requirements, you know, not-for-profit organizations. Was it with a firm or, or, yes. or a company was? Okay. Yes. Um, so I was with a firm working on a lot of different types of audits. Mm -hmm. But many of my clients had some sort of compliance component to the audit, either a, a hospital with a cost report, a not-for-profit organization with federal funding, a government contract or financial institutions. So, you know, from pretty early on, my, my focus was on more compliance auditing. But after several years of auditing, uh, the forensic aspect of the accounting really kicked in in terms of being exposed to a couple of investigations. And uh, that became an area that I really specialized in, more of the forensic accounting, doing compliance and other types of, of forensic investigations. And uh, so for a number of years, I had my own practice, uh, kind of a small boutique practice here in the Washington, D.C. area where that's exactly what we specialized in. Um, and then along the way, I, I spent some time with, uh, with a couple of other uh, firms uh, doing the same so sort of work. Um, I actually then spent about two years as a compliance officer uh, for an organization here in, in, in Washington, D.C. But more of my compliance-related experience has been as that third party, kind of a third party advisor, with initially the focus being purely on investigations, but then over time that evolved too to um, be more of a proactive advisor and doing a lot of risk assessments and d helping to design compliance programs, training programs, ethics programs, things of that nature. In, in your experience, and this is going back over 30 years, uh, and, and I know this, on, on looking at your bio, that you're a, you're a fraud expert. You, you, you've done a lot of work in, in, in fraud and, and corruption. Um, what, what's the number one type of uh, act that a company or individuals within a company does that you've seen that, yeah. that's, that I is, it, just, it just keeps happening over and over again? Yeah, the, the, the most common ones are still some of the smallest, quite, mm -hmm. quite frankly. There are the, the, the small asset misappropriations. We've, that's a, bit, a broad category of asset misappropriation. But they're, they're the little things, you know, people cheating on an expense report and, and little things, things like that. Little things like that, yeah. Yeah, that's far and away still the most, most common. Um, but we should never get complacent about those as well because what I've seen is some organizations that do begin – taking a, a, you know, a kind of a lax approach to, th to those because they're small, you know, and they say, well, how much time do we want to devote to finding a, you know, a $200 fraud? Um, but what we've also found is, you know, many times that's the, the, the tip of the iceberg. And once someone begins rationalizing. Because it's cultural. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And once that's in the culture that it's okay to pad your expense report by $50, well, the hardest 
money to steal is the, is the initial money. It becomes progressively easier and easier to justify larger and larger amounts. So, you know, that's one of the things that I always had, had you know, informed my clients about was that, you know, when you do find the small frauds, it is important uh, to, to deal with them, um, take disciplinary action, shore up the internal controls, because that is many times the starting point. Yeah, and there's a form of embezzlement. I mean, it's a little tiny part, yeah. but but then but then it kind of filters up through the organization or in a lot of ways filters down. It does. I guess. Absolutely. It really does. Now, in terms of bribery, uh, have you worked on a lot of mm -hmm. cases that involve bribery? Sure. Sure. Yeah, can you give us some, some examples? Yeah, I, you know, se several FCPA cases mm -hmm. and then several non-FCPA cases where it's just a, a crooked vendor, you know, mm -hmm. bribing a procurement agent, you know, to get business from an organization. That's still probably the more common, um, you know, because that's that's every day, just commercial bribery. Uh, you see that all over the place. In, in, now, in procurement, do you see that more on the on the federal level here in the United States or on the state and local level? It's all levels. All, all levels? Yeah, even private companies to private companies. And of course, when you're dealing with, with, with overseas, when we're dealing with the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, I'm sure you've seen a lot of egregious examples of it as well. Very egregious examples, but also, uh, and, and interesting, it's, it's sort of what I call a, like an arms race between the, the bad guys and the good guys here, and that as companies have gotten better and gotten more proactive with their compliance programs, the crooks have upped their game as well. So we're seeing more instances where the bribe is hidden very, very well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's two or three layers down. It's in the supply chain, but it's not even directly in a supply chain. It's in a, a, a subsidiary of a subsidiary of a supplier uh, or some shell company that, that is being used. So the, the cases, while there's still some very simple cases out there, uh, the cases overall um, have gotten more complex in that regard, a little bit harder to detect, a little harder to investigate. Anna, tell our listeners a little bit about some of the stuff that we're doing here at SIPE in terms of, of compliance that that Jerry can chime in on. And, uh. Uh, sure, and that will not be news to uh, Jerry since uh, SIPE and uh, SEC have, have been uh, cooperating for quite a while and we're, yeah. we're hoping to, to continue uh, this partnership under uh, his new leadership. Uh, I mean, essentially, our activities are, are, are and our, our, our missions are very much aligned. So, SIPE mm -hmm. works in uh, emerging markets, frontier markets, places where <laughs> a typical third party violation of an FCPA, uh, for instance, uh, just happens. Yep. Uh, and uh, we focus both, both on helping to improve the business environment overall by working with local partners on policy reforms so that. Um, it is just a, f a safer, cleaner environment for everybody to operate in for foreign companies and uh, subsidiaries for local companies and so on. Uh, and uh, we also work with local businesses to help them, uh, especially mid-sized businesses, uh, to help them better understand uh, what having a compliance program might mean, what the business case for it might be, uh, how it can be a really great way to manage your risks. Uh, and how it can be a way to open uh, business uh, opportunities with, especially with multinational corporations who are very much uh, concerned about uh, their exposure in developing markets. You know, one question that I always ask myself, and, and we've done a lot of interviews with people who have similar backgrounds to yours, but, but coming at it maybe a little bit different, different direction. Um, one thing that I, I keep hearing is that, it, you know, we talked about the evolution from the 1970s into now, and we talked about how companies view themselves and, and, and view their role in anti-corruption efforts. What are, we talked about a few while ago, like public relations and shareholders and things like that, but what are the, e the, the raw economic uh, indicators that uh, provide hope for companies that that comply. You know, w w w why is it in their financial interest to to have a strong compliance program? Well, it's there's the carrot and stick, mm -hmm. you know, aspect to it. With with clearly the the penalties and the disgorgement of profits that are imposed when a company is caught uh, are so substantial. It, it, it would not having a compliance program would be analogous to let's just stop having insurance uh, as well. Because and that's a pretty strong statement. Yeah, yeah, uh, but I, I believe it. You know, it, you might as well just not have insurance. Um, you know, well, we'll take our chances that it won't have a fire. We'll take our chances that, um, you know, rather than being more proactive about it. 
so, so I think there's a, a clear connection there. And it, it actually, for the first time in, in recent years, we're starting to see it become uh, you know, an asset for an organization in terms of recruiting. You know, again, the, the, the current workforce is, is changing and integrity and ethics uh, are becoming more important, I think, to more people. You know, uh, we're, we're seeing it in some of the youngest folks just entering the workplace. Um, you know, as generations change, one, one of the great things about the, the young people today is that that is something that's important to them. Um, what do you see as the biggest incentive? Is it the penalties, do you think, for companies? Un unfortunately, it's probably still the penalties, still, that, that, okay. that, that aspect. But, that but if, you do if, say with the younger generation, yeah. the, just the culture itself is starting to change the a little bit. The culture is changing. Um, you know, we hear, you know, those of us that are older hear all the, the negative things about, oh, young people today. But, you know, I'll tell you what, yeah, the, the young uh, people today have it together in this area. And, and we're, we're seeing more and more of them ask questions about things like, you know, what's, you know, what's your workplace culture like and, and, and things of that nature. And it's, it's more important to them. Well, we talked about regions of the world, and I'm assuming places like Russia, uh, probably China. Uh, 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 Latin America or, or some trouble spots. In, 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 am I correct on that? Or yes, yes. It, it pretty much aligns with you know the Transparency International uh, right. know, uh, Corruption Perception yep. Index, and, and that's that's a pretty good measure, really, of where the most uh, corrupt parts of the world are. Yeah, and, and, and what's the center? synergy between governments and companies in the in these regions it, you know which, which, which is leading which is it the the companies that are you know kind of kind of bribing the the government officials or is it a partnership i mean how, how does that really work it, it's hard to uh, hard to say who started it who started <laughs> it exactly uh, but th those relationships are there and and you know interestingly in some of the countries where we have seen reform it's been the general public that I've heard that really before. We've, we've talked to a lot of guests that have come in and said the exact same thing. Can you, can you give us some examples on, on the, the how that works a, a in action? A few of the Latin American countries, you know, where, where you had demonstrations mm -hmm. uh, about corrupt politicians and, and things, and, and it ultimately led to, the really, the public uh, pushing, pushing reform. Um, you know, the public sees that this is actually not just a, you know, a lack of integrity or lack of ethics, but it's pulling resources from the economy. It's, pu it's pulling things that the public is entitled to uh, because this is very, very wasteful. It's, a, it's an improper use of, of funds. And, and they're and getting cheated. And they're getting cheated. Yeah, and they're that's the bottom line. Yeah. Absolutely. And are you seeing the same thing with the work that we're doing here in terms of, you know, public pressure? Uh, yes, definitely. And if, if you look around the world, that tends to be in, in sort of in many places the tipping point where sort of the population says, enough uh, takes to the street. Uh, I think the key challenge is how do you uh, institutionalize that outreach right. into something that uh, into sort of systemic changes and systemic reforms that actually uh, improve the situation longer term. But uh, <laughs> that's that's what uh, site is involved in uh, as well. But that's that's a long longer term uh, project. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry, w I have a segment on my program called Five Years from Now. And which, which kind of ends the, the podcast. But if you were going to come back and do this podcast five years from now, what would we be talking about? Well, hopefully we will be talking about um, a broadening globally of the acceptance and the maturity level of compliance programs. Uh, we're definitely seeing the trend. Uh, I expect it to continue. I expect it to get more complicated along the way, too, uh, without a doubt. But uh, I'm very much an optimist. Are you trending up or trending down? <laughs> yes, <laughs> trending up, trending Tr up. Yeah, I, I would I, also I, say I, trending more uh, broadly in terms of areas. You know, what's on my mind this week yeah, in particular true. and probably on the minds of uh, many of our listeners is data privacy. Uh, as we are sure. recording this session, something called GDPR, the General Data Protection uh -huh. Regulation, is coming into force in the EU and sort of is having rippling effects around the world. So Can you explain a little bit more what that is? Uh, I wish I could. Uh, I don't. I think there's still a lot of questions. A lot of questions. Marks yeah. uh, around specific requirements, but the, the bottom line is um, companies and other entities that handle data of citizens or residents, to my best understanding of the EU, have to take extra steps and extra 
um, sort of disclosures on uh, and, and special policies on how that data is being handled. Uh, so that's just one example, but that, that's the trend I'm seeing, that compliance is not just about anti-corruption, it's about labor, it's about environment, and it's right. about cybersecurity, a yeah. growing number of And we of haven't even talked about procurement very much either, which is a big part of it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's so many we aspects. We could do a whole show on procurement oh, by yeah. itself. Oh, yeah, and a whole show on, on data privacy. On data exactly processing. Right. GDPR, it's... Um, you know, even though it's been out there for a while, just taking effect, uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty as to how that's going to be enforced and what the real effect is going to be. I've seen people on one hand saying, well, now we can no longer do sufficient due diligence on our vendors because of the data privacy. Areas. I, I don't personally think that that's, yeah. that's the case, but you have these extreme views still bouncing around. So I think it's going to take a little while for that to sort of settle well, in. The other thing too, Jerry, is technology in itself is changing so rapidly. How is that helping or hindering the compliance process? Well, it, and I think it's both. Yeah. Uh, we, I, you I, talked about you know the people who are trying to get around these rules, they're using it as well. I'm yes, sure. yes, because of where the technology is an asset for for us is, you know, we have an improved ability to monitor for signs of non-compliance, mm -hmm. for breakdowns in internal controls, whereas in the past, where things were more manual in nature, it was very difficult to, to monitor uh, whether we are seeing things break, control, internal controls breaking down in one region or one operation or another. Now, with there being much more digital evidence and then the technology to uh, apply to that digital evidence, we can we have the capability of jumping on compliance matters much more rapidly. But, of course, the crooks <laughs> of the world, they, they know they, it as well. They use technology yeah. Um, yeah, to, to their benefit as well. And they yeah. take advantage of new, where I see a big, big risk with a lot of companies, by the way, is companies uh, deploying new technology too rapidly in, in internally, or technology that hasn't been sufficiently tested for weaknesses and, and opportunities for the bad folks. What could possibly go wrong? Exactly, right? yeah. It's like, oh, this this will help improve our, this will streamline our yeah. expense reporting process or whatever it is. Yes, there's that operational benefit, but many times it's opening the door to new risks. Now, are governments and and uh, uh, laws or, 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 or changes to laws keeping up with this technology? No, they never do. Yeah. They really it's never just do. Just like anything it's, else. It's very reactive, and sometimes it's very slow to yeah. react that it's only after there have been big, big problems that the government kind of says, hey, maybe there's a problem here. Now, we, we talked about laws like Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Does that get amended from time to time to, to keep up with some of these changes that we're talking no, about? No, they're really only uh, – uh, very rarely. Very, very rarely, okay. yes. There, there's been, I think, one amendment to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. I'm, I'm not a FCPA guru in that in that respect. Yeah. But there's uh, similar but laws in – Yes. In, yeah, in, but, but do they – so, so they're, they're kind of slow and behind the eight ball. And yes. So, some acts have been amended more than others, mm -hmm. um, but 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 it they tend, tends to be very slow. Great. Well, Jerry, thanks so much for coming in. I know you we, you got to run to another meeting real quick. But, oh, thank uh, you for having you me. You said you're going to be pleasure. here in a couple more months. I'll be back and, in a couple months. And, uh, well, I, w hopefully we'll talk to you again. Uh, maybe we can talk next time just on procurement. That would be great. So, w Which is a subject very near and dear to us here. And uh, a lot of people find it boring, but it's, it's actually the backbone of everything governments do, and people don't realize that. Half of our operations is always buying stuff. It, it, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. That would be a fascinating conversation. Anna, thanks so much for coming in. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Okay. See you all next week. Bye. You've been listening to Democracy That Delivers. For more information about the Center for International Private Enterprise, please go to our website at cipe.org. That's C-I-P-E dot org. Thanks for listening.